One of the mottos of life that I've heard to be the most prepared is to always expect the unexpected. And that if you expect the unexpected, then you could be prepared for every situation, whether it be camping trips or trips with kids, or you're trying to plan out and map out your financial year. I think it goes without saying that life doesn't always go the way that you and I had planned. So maybe making occasions to consider what could go wrong, as well as what if this were to happen, then the thing that I predict is a great way to be being prepared. We're going to encounter another healing episode in which Jesus is going to heal another man. And that might feel repetitive after the past couple of weeks of covering Jesus healing a leper last week. And then two weeks ago, Jesus healing uh, numerous people over in a city or a town called Capernaum. And even before that, Jesus healing or casting out a demon. And so it seems like these healing episodes happen over and over and over again. And it can feel a little bit redundant. And now I want to share with you, hey, expect the unexpected because the way that Jesus heals this man is different than all the other healings that he does throughout the rest of the gospel. And so we're going to see what distinguishes this healing amongst all the other healings that he's done, as well as what this healing reveals about himself. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, please turn with me to Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. It's page 837 if you have a Bible from church. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. All right, once you're there, please stand with me if you're able for the reading of God's word. We stand as a sign of reverence and respect for God's word. And so we stand together hearing and reading God's word from Mark 2, 1 through 12. This is the reading of God's word. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men and when they could not get near because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let the down bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, My son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sin but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in the spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Amen. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. If you look down with me at verse 1, we see Jesus returning back to Capernaum. And that happens right after Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 45, when Jesus heals a leper, and because of the leper who had distinct instructions not to tell people about Jesus and his miracles, ends up disobeying and blabbing his mouth about what Jesus had done for him, Jesus was cast out into the wilderness, unable to go back into the towns because of just a critical mass and following that would have come every time he gathered. Mark chapter 2 verse 1 tells us that it, this happened after some days, after some of the hype had died down. He returns back to Capernaum after being forced out of the wilderness, but he still is drawing crowds. If you look down with me at verse 2, Jesus isn't naturally healing at this moment, but he's preaching the word to them. And still, even still, there's no room to gather. Verse 2 says that even there's not even room towards the door. This place is packed. And Mark makes a comment as to the popularity of Jesus' ministry, not to denote success or momentum, 
but rather the popularity of his ministry provides a foil, an obstacle for four friends who are trying to bring their paralytic friend towards Jesus. We see their plan unfold in verses three to four of these four friends who try to bring their paralytic friend who is unable to walk to the place of Jesus. So the front door is shut. There's no way to go through Jesus through the crowd. The crowd is even at the door that's described in verse two. So they have to hatch a plot, an Ocean's Eleven or Capernaum Ocean's Eleven kind of plot in order to set into motion, hey, how are we gonna get our friend on this mat to Jesus? And so they know that back in those days, they had a one uh, floor house with a roof that was flat and they had an exterior staircase in which they could make it to that roof. The roof back in those days were made through wooden beams but within the lodging between those wooden beams, you would stuff it with straw, with mud, and fill the gaps. After you filled the gaps of that with these wooden beams, you would go ahead and overlay tile uh, on the top and on the bottom of that house. Now, you have to think about these men. They go ahead and carry their friend all the way up to the top, and then they work themselves into digging through the wood, digging through the mud, digging through the tile, just two feet worth in that roof, big enough in order for them to put down their friend and bring him to the feet of Jesus. It was a laborious process, and it was a process that took time. You could imagine you're sitting there listening to Jesus talking, and you start hearing scraps up on the ceiling. Then you start seeing debris start falling down, then you see a hole open up and you see a head peer down at that hole looking straight at you. It's not easy to teach given those kinds of instructions. Believe me, I know. It is very hard to teach when that's happening. And they must have just been filled with like, what is going on? Who are these guys and how, what, what are they even doing? Some of the thoughts that maybe are associated, imagine if yourself that you were there you're there listening to Jesus in this house. And what you would have thought about those four friends and that paralytic as you're trying to listen to the message of Jesus. You see them come down and you look up and you're like, how irresponsible of them. They didn't come early. They didn't refresh Ticketmaster like I did at 12 p.m. at night over and over again to get these kinds of seats. Now these guys are trying to sneak their way in. They should have been more responsible. How reckless of them. Don't they see that they could get someone really hurt? What if one of those beams, God forbid, just landed on us because of what they're trying to do? How irresponsible, how reckless, how impatient are they? I'm sure Jesus would have stuck around. He, should have, he would have cared for their friend who's, on, you know, who's a paralytic. Like they, maybe if they had just waited by the back door, they could have met with Jesus. We think about how to categorize these friends and we see them in more negative senses, right? That they're irresponsible, they're reckless, they're inconsiderate. And yet that's not exactly how Jesus sees them. If you look down with me at verse five, we notice that Jesus looks at them in a more positive way. Jesus doesn't notice their irresponsibility, their recklessness or their impatience, but rather verse five tells us that Jesus saw their what? Jesus saw their faith. Their faith stood out to them. And it's interesting to note to say that Jesus understood and saw their faith. Because the way that we would use faith is describing it more as a feeling or maybe more as knowledge. When these four friends came to Jesus, they weren't coming up with holy hands lifted up and tears or I guess in our church here today, it's clapping. It's like, oh, clapping is maybe a sign of faith when we sing together. So there was no feeling, no emotion. That wasn't what Jesus saw. Nor did they come and say, oh, son of the Lord most high, oh, son of David, we have come. You, you who are triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, eternally existing together, we have brought you our paralytic friend. They do not display any amount of knowledge or any degree of sincerity. All that Jesus measures about who they are and what they believed is seen by their what? 
It is seen by their action. And this gives us an opportunity to hone in on what Jesus saw specifically about these friends, about their faith. These friends display for us here today what genuine faith in seeking Jesus looks like. It's more than just knowledge. It's more than just sincerity or a feeling or an emotion. But genuine faith, seeing it upon these two people or upon these group of friends, has two characteristics. Number one, genuine faith needs an object. The reason why in which they sought and made uh, all of these um, plans in order for their friend to see Jesus is because they truly believe that Jesus, the object of their faith, had the power, ability, and the will to heal their friend. Their faith was not misplaced. It was not in some kind of technique. It was not in some kind of religious ritual. The reason why they're moving heaven and earth to get their friend there is because they put their faith in Jesus. Jesus is the object of their faith. And faith always needs an object to put their hope or trust in. Faith works a lot like love, where you cannot just say, I love, right? You can't say that. Or you can't say, I love love. And I, I don't know if there's any Ted Lasso fans in here, but it, it doesn't make any sense to say, I believe in believe. Like what? You can't believe in believe. Belief, faith, love, it all needs an object to direct its affection or place its hope in. These four friends went through all of this laborious process because they believed and they put their faith in Jesus. Jesus is the one who's able to heal our friends. We need to get our friends to Jesus. Faith needs an object. Second, secondly, we want to share that genuine faith works. Genuine faith works. In Protestant churches, we do make a big emphasis that it is not our, our works that save us, but it is our faith. But if you read James chapter 2, verse 17, it shares to us, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Genuine faith has works. It is not the root of our salvation, but it sure is the fruit of our salvation. If we have genuine faith, it manifests itself into action, into response. And you see this in this, these men. They could have stopped at any time. They could have said, oh, well, we were too late. Ah, oh, doggone it. I guess that door was closed. I guess it wasn't God's will for our friend to be able to meet Jesus. But you see them in this place going up the stairs, digging through two feet of gravel, opening up, stopping, being this huge center of attention while Jesus is healing and then dropping their friend ever so delicately down onto the mat right in front of Jesus. They did that. They overcame all those obstacles, overcame any of those judgments, those passing judgment or comments that people would make. They took that risk because they what? They had faith. Their genuine faith worked. They could have turned back any time, and yet they continued to persevere because they believed. If you're not a Christian here today, we are so grateful that you're here. When you look at these four friends and their desire, their insistency, their stubbornness to go and seek Jesus out, can that pursuit of Jesus be said about you? Do you pursue Jesus like this? Because these men provide for us here today a model of what it looks like to be desperate, to see Jesus as the object of their faith. And if you are seeking Jesus here today, learn from these men. Seek seriously. Seek seriously. Don't do it as a passing time. Don't do it as a side hustle. But give your devotion and attention to him. I love this quote by American poet Ralph Waldo Emerson, and I know it's been true in my life. Man is as lazy as he dares to be. The way that in which 
we're stopped by our own laziness is all stopped by ourselves. It is our volition that stops us. You know, I've talked with students here in my time in youth, and, uh, you know, I'm a good Calvinist, so I'll say to them, yeah, it's God's will to save. It is up to God and God alone. And so some of them, you know, and they're clever because they listen to my preaching, uh, not because they listen to my preaching, but because they want to use my preaching against me, they say, well, I guess I'll just leave it up to God to zap me with Holy Spirit juice. And then when God zaps me, that's when I'll turn my life around. That's when I'll give my life to Jesus. But they could go on living their own life, doing their own thing, seeking after popularity, dates, and academic acclaim. And they just think that by God's good graces, that he'll just kind of zap them in without any effort, without any seeking of themselves. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 tells us God rewards those who earnestly seek him. And if you are not a believer here today, do not wait for God to just supernaturally, magically just change your heart. You need to be seeking after him. Who is Jesus? What's all the big fuss about about Christianity? What does the Bible really say about what Jesus says? What are my own preconceived notions and thoughts? about Christianity? Where do I need to, what makes me not look at Christianity from an objective lens? Maybe it's because I've been hurt by people in the church. Maybe it's because I've seen hypocrisy in people in my family. Maybe that's guarding and shading the way that I'm looking and approaching Jesus here. We want to invite you here today to seek Jesus seriously. When you unclutter your mind with thoughts, doubts, and negative examples, and you look to the objective word of God, seek Jesus because he is found through here. Do not be lazy, but seek him seriously. Secondly, if you are not a believer here today, seek Jesus obediently. Because when you're trying to find Jesus, he's not going to just ask you to revise your ideas about what makes a good life, about who he is. He's going to ask you to reform your life. You cannot just look at Jesus from a microscope and say, how interesting. He can be fully God and fully man. That's pretty cool. He's not a subject to be studied, but rather he is there to be Lord and Savior over your life. So if you come to seek him, you must seek him obediently. Theologian P. Carnegie Simpson says this, We had thought intellectually to examine him. We find he's spiritually examining us. The roles are reversed between us. A person may study Jesus with intellectual impartiality, but he cannot do it with moral neutrality. We must declare our colors. Jesus gives to us here today in Mark chapter 2 a way of what it looks like to genuinely seek after him And why do they do that? It's because of their faith, a faith that places its object in Jesus and a faith that actually works. But expect the unexpected, right? Because we would think, all right, that this story could kind of end here. Like, wow, these uh, these friends really just overcame every obstacle, every limitation in order to bring their poor friend down to Jesus. And we would think we can just tie a knot on this, you know, ship it away and say, all right, this healing done, next. If Jesus just healed this man and this man just deserves to be healed, right? He was able to go through all of these different trials and tribulations and all these hurdles in order to be at the foot of Jesus. But here, expect the unexpected because notice Jesus' response to them in verses 5 through 7. Notice what Jesus does not say in verse 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, He said to the paralytic, my son, your sins are forgiven. Notice what he does not say is, my son, you are healed. Verse 6 goes on. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus does something so unexpected 
and goes ahead and not heals this man, but declares upon this man, your sins are forgiven. And that response makes everyone question or unhappy. The first of which are being the scribes. Verse 6, we see the scribes' response to Jesus, questioning inside of their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? We're introduced to the scribes in Mark chapter 1, in verses 21 through 28. And scribes back in those days were experts in the word of God. In a place where literacy was less than 5% of the population, scribes stood out not only in being able to read, but in being able to write, and not in just being able to write, but being able to teach, being able to teach the word of God to others. Not only being able to teach, but to also know the word so well to apply it into their lives. People would come up to scribes and say, what does the word of God say? about whether I could work or do this on Saturday? What does the word of God say about how I'm supposed to discipline my son? What does the word of God say about how we are to conduct business, this kind of business in this life? Can we sell wine? Can we sell wine to Gentiles? Can we sell wine to Jewish people? And so scribes would get all sorts of these kinds of questions and using their knowledge of God's word would be able to make opinions or not opinions, but be able to give their verdict as to what God's word says about that specific issue. Scribes was like a teacher, a professor, and a lawyer all wrapped into one. It was a very professional and a very elite kind of job that you would need a lot of studying as well as a good base of morality for. You wouldn't want to listen to a scribe that did everything contrary to what he said. So these were moral men, These were well-studied men, and specifically, these were men who were studied in the word of God. And so, upon hearing Jesus saying, your sins are forgiven, their clocks are, or their their mind is racing at this moment. How can this man speak like that? How can this man speak like that when God's word clearly says that it is God and God alone who can forgive sin? Their minds could have turned to Exodus 34, verse 6. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. They could have clearly thought about Psalm 103, verse 3, the Lord who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. They could have easily turned to Isaiah 43, 25, I, God, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sin. Or our call to worship passage in Micah. All of these give specific reference that it is God and God alone who can forgive sin. And it can only be God who can forgive sin because sin is what? Sin is rebellion against God. Sure, it hurts your neighbor when you steal from them, when you hurt them, or when you gossip or lie to them. But the real rebellion, the real person that it hurts on a more major scale is that is rebellion against our creator. And if our sin is an offense that we do against or to God, then it must make sense that only God and God alone can forgive sin. Imagine for yourself here today, um, I feel like I use this illustration in Cross Seeds and I use the, almost the same people, but because you guys are sitting right here, this is my brother Ian and this is my brother Michael. Not genuine brothers, but brothers in Christ. Well, I guess that does make them genuine brothers, but go on and so forth. And so imagine for yourself, they're in a tiff, right? They're, they're fighting about something, something inane, right? I don't know. Michael stole five bucks from Ian or something like that. And then 
Ian is really mad, like, you stole five bucks, I saw you, and then Ian, and then Michael is justifying it in some kind of weird way, and they're about to fight, and I just break in, break them up, as a good pastor would do, and I said, hey, hey, guys, don't fight, all right? Hey, Ian, I forgive you. Yeah. So Ian is going to feel like, oh, sweet, right? Man, awesome. How's Michael going to feel? You don't have any right to forgive Ian. He didn't do the wrong to you. He did the wrong to me. Forgiveness can only be given by the offended party. As a third party, I have no right, even as a pastor, to forgive Ian. Forgiveness needs to come from Michael. Now, taking that illustration and that definition of sin and saying that our sins are an offense against God, who can forgive sin but the offended party? Who can forgive sin but God alone? The scribes were reading scripture right in this moment. They clearly understood what God's word says and saying sin can only be forgiven by God. That statement of blasphemy to Jesus is right. Only God can forgive sin. And you are blaspheming when you say that you can stand in the place of God to forgive sin. Are sins done to you? Can you be the outlet in which sins are forgiven? Notice the genius of what Jesus does right here. He gives the people here listening two choices. He is either a blasphemer speaking on behalf of God or he is God himself with the ability to forgive sin. The easy thing, and you know, this ruckus could have all have just been prevented if Jesus just healed this guy and he just kind of went on and was able to teach everyone else. But Jesus upsets the scribes in forgiving this man's sin. Jesus leaves a choice both to them and to us. Jesus can only be one of two things. He is either a blasphemer, crazy, or with such pride to think that he is in the place of God to forgive sin, or that Jesus truly is God with the ability and willingness to forgive this man's sin. But it's not just the scribes who are shocked and expect and are, get the unexpected treatment of Jesus forgiving this man. Think about how you would have felt if you were that paralytic, where your friends had just went through this whole process. You had created great property damage and had brought just so much shame in stopping uh, this teacher from teaching. And you lowered in your mat on right before the feet of Jesus, wanting what? you would have wanted to be healed. That's what you came for. I didn't come for religious talk. I didn't come for religious mumbo jumbo. Jesus, I wanna be able to walk again. And instead of Jesus declaring you healed, instead, he goes ahead and says, I'm gonna forgive your sins. It is such an interesting part because Jesus had healed so many people before this person and yet Jesus, instead of just healing this man, goes ahead and says, I'm going to forgive your sins. Did you read the room, Jesus? Did you read why my friends made such an effort to get me down to this place? It's not that that's not nice, and I appreciate the gesture, but Jesus, I came to be able to walk. I came so that you would heal my paralysis. Why would Jesus... Just simply say your sins are forgiven to this man who was clearly seeking something else from Jesus. Bible commentators ask that question as well. Was it because this man's illness, his paralysis, was a result or connected to some kind of sin? The answer to that is that it could be. Scripture isn't definitive as to why Jesus says it like that. But it's interesting to note that when this man's sins are forgiven, he doesn't have the ability or wherewithal to be able to walk, take up his mat, and go home. That comes later in this passage. So immediately, the forgiveness of his sins, which was declared by Jesus and made right, 
wasn't the way in which he was able to access his feet uh, and walk out of the room again. So I don't consider that to be a good answer for us to why Jesus connects it, why Jesus connects this man's healing to the forgiveness of sin. Another uh, Bible commentator writes, could this be that Jesus connects the idea of this man's forgiveness of sin uh, to his healing be for Jesus to use this man as an object lesson to be able to show that he truly has the ability to forgive sin. And it could be, but we know that that's not how Jesus operates. Jesus isn't here to give object lessons and use people as illustrations. He has compassion upon people. He doesn't use them as mere objects to be able to be zoomed in and to just be highlighted of. Jesus is not like that. He's not a user of people. And so why then? Why does Jesus connect this man's healing with the forgiveness of his sins? And the reason I believe is this. The reason Jesus tells this man that his sins are forgiven is because Jesus knew what this man needed the most. This man needed to be forgiven of sin. What he thought was his greatest desire, what he presumed was his greatest need, was his ability to be able to walk. That would be any paralytic's great desire, right? They would want the ability to be able to walk again. And there's different kinds of treatment and physical therapy that one can go through, but there's no one who's doing and acting and working like the person of Jesus Christ who's able to give life back to old, withered limbs, who's able to restore people, not just from the disease of leprosy and stop it, but to make that person whole again, to take back and rewind the clock of when that life, what that life was like before the disease had come in. There was no one with the ability to do what Jesus did. And if you're a paralytic, you would want to meet this man no matter what. He has something to offer that no one else can offer. Your greatest need, your greatest desire to be healed of your disease could be lifted up. And yet Jesus, knowing that, understands that this man got his greatest need wrong. What this man needed more than the ability to walk again was the forgiveness of his sin. In our day and age, it's so easy to zoom in onto people's disabilities to be able to say that that really defines them. But Jesus here is saying you're more than your disability. That is not your identity. You and I are more than our upbringing. You and I are more than the gifts that you and I have. But did you know that the most distinctively, uh, the distinctive quality of a person is not their upbringing, is not their disability, is not all the things that they could put on on their LinkedIn profile, is not all their things that they have in social media, it's their college degree or expertise. The most distinctive quality about you and I is our sin. And that's the most distinctive quality between you and I that you and I have because nothing about us has the most eternal consequences when left unforgiven. That then must mean that our sins are the most significant thing about us. Our greatest need is not for our legs to be healed, for our circumstances to be right, to get what we have wanted in our dreams. Our greatest need is to be forgiven of our sin. Pastor John MacArthur says this, to escape the wrath of God poured out on sinners eternally in hell, the greatest need of man is to escape the wrath of God poured out eternally on sinners in hell. Only Christianity, only the Christian gospel offers the benefit that meets that need. Only through the Christian gospel can anyone escape the wrath of God poured out on sinners eternally in hell. What sends people to hell? You say sin. No, it is not sin alone that sends people to hell. It is unforgiven sin. It is unforgiven sin that sends people to hell. 
Hell is only occupied by people whose sins have never been and will never be forgiven. Heaven, on the other hand, is occupied by people whose sins have all been forgiven. Therefore, what causes people to escape the wrath of God in eternal hell is the forgiveness of their sins. That is man's greatest need, to move him from hell to heaven. Jesus heals this man of his greatest need, not to be healed from his disability, but to be forgiven of his sin. And if you are not a believer here today, maybe you have come to church because you're looking for some kind of community. Maybe you think your greatest need is finding some kind of purpose. Maybe you think your greatest need is to exercise that spiritual bone in your body that has been neglected for too long as you chased after career or academic success. No, friends. Your greatest need is to have your sins forgiven before God. And what Jesus shows to us from this scripture text here today is that he is willing and able to forgive your sins. Only through him, only through the Christian gospel can you and I escape from the wrath of God in which Jesus bears the punishment for our sins on the cross for us. This offer here today is that you and I can be forgiven of sin. And now notice what this man did not do. This man did not earn or deserve or work for his healing. This man is a paralytic. There is nothing that he offered to Jesus. No work that he was ever able to do before him. But Jesus still forgave him. Because forgiveness of sin is not a matter of trying hard, of sincerity, of working for it. Forgiveness of sin comes because God is a willing God to forgive our sins. He is merciful and gracious. All you need to do is come. Come in your disability, come in your weakness, come in your uncleanness, and you can receive the mercy of Christ and have those words said about you. Your sins are forgiven. Your trajectory changed from eternal hell to eternal heaven, all because you have trusted in Jesus, all because Jesus spoke over you, your sins are forgiven. If you are not a believer here today, we do hope and pray that you would believe in this gospel about what Jesus has done for you to forgive you of your sin. And if you are unsure of what that means, please come talk to any of the pastors or the member that brought you or any of your friends around here that say that they are Christian, we would love to share with you what it means to have your sins forgiven. But even here, as we go throughout this text, this text is not done. There are still five more verses to cover because Jesus, understanding and knowing the hearts of the scribes, casting doubt as to Jesus' claim, goes ahead and gives them an opportunity to see who he really is. Look down with me at verses 8 through 12. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves and said to them, Why do you question these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like it. Verse 8 confronts us with that question, what is easier to say? Is it easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to be able to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? If you think about that for a moment, you might be thinking to yourself, well, what is easier to say? What is the harder thing to ask? And there's been pages and ink spilled on Bible commentaries and trying to answer that question, what really is easier to say? To be able to understand this text as to what Jesus is trying to do, we need to understand both what Jesus is trying to prove and who he's trying to prove it to. If you look down with me at verse 10, who is Jesus trying to prove that he has authority to forgive sin? 
If you look at verse 10, that word you, Jesus is speak, speaking specifically to the scribes. The scribes who in their hearts doubted Jesus has the ability to forgive sins. And why do they think that Jesus has, Jesus doesn't have the ability to forgive sin? It's because they see him as just a man. They just see him as, how can a man speak like this? Whenever a man takes the place of God, he's doing what? He is blaspheming. And so Jesus gives them an object lesson and shows to them this. Look, if I am who I am claimed to be, what do you think is harder for me to say to this man? In their minds, they would say, it must be harder for you to say, rise, take up your bed and go home. Because anyone could say that your sins are forgiven. And there's no definitive way for us to prove whether those sins are forgiven or not. But if you were to go to this man, what's harder to prove is that if I could really prove that I healed this man, because I could say, rise, take up your bed and walk. And if that man in front of everyone is still unable to walk, I have just proven to all that I do not have the ability to heal, that I don't have the authority to make this man whole again. So what's easier to be able to declare to this man, your sins are forgiven and have no qualitative way to prove it, or to be able to say, rise, take up your bed and go home and in front of everyone, be able to display whether I could heal him or not. In the scribe's mind, rise, take up your bed and go home is much harder to prove and to show than just being able to say your sins are forgiven. Anyone can say that. And how can we verify it? How can we definitively prove it? And so Jesus does the harder thing to be able to show that he can do the easier thing, which is to forgive sin. Easier not in the sense where it's easier to forgive sin rather than heal this man, but easier to prove. So in that sense, Jesus shows to them that he does have the power. He does have the authority to be able to not just heal this man, but also to forgive sin. Verse 12 ends in a great culmination of people amazed, glorifying God, speaking to themselves, we have never seen anything like this. We have never seen a man being able to make someone who was lame, paralyzed, to be able to walk in front of everyone. We've never seen anyone like this man to speak like Jesus did. We've never seen any man come and definitively tell people that their sins are forgiven and have the ability and authority to prove it. Jesus reveals himself to be, in verse 10, the son of man. He is unlike man. He is the son of man. So when the scribes accuse him and say, how can a man speak like this? Jesus says, I'm the son of man. I'm the Messiah that was pointed to in Daniel chapter 7, who is going to rule and reign and bring God's kingdom down upon earth. And part of my duty and part of my kingdom is going to be that I have the ability and the willingness to not just change people's diseases, but I have the ability and the willingness to change people's hearts. I have the ability to forgive sins. Jesus meets people who are spiritually paralyzed. And these people are the scribes, the scribes that we see in verse 6 who are sitting specifically enough. They're not encouraging, exhorting. They're not praising God just like everyone else. They're sitting, doubting, complaining, judging. Empty religious knowledge will never change and transform your heart. What Jesus shows to this paralytic, to his friends, and to all the people gathered into this house, that Jesus is the true Son of Man, the Messiah, with the ability and the willingness to forgive sin. Jesus confronts this man of his greatest need, 
His healing, which came afterwards, wasn't the great result of this rejoicing and proclaiming. This man will be found in heaven because of Jesus meeting his greatest need, his need to be forgiven of sin. Because new limbs will wither again, circumstances will change, relationships, even the best ones, will die and fizzle out. And yet what Jesus gives and grants to us in forgiveness of sin lasts for an eternity of a life. You and I need, and our most important need, is the forgiveness of our sins. And as a Christian here today, if you are a believer in Christ, can we just rejoice over this news that our sins are forgiven? I know that as Christians, we live a very difficult life living in this world. There are significant challenges and uh, discouragements that come. And there's many times in our hearts where we feel like we need certain things. We need certain things to go our way. And yet, when was the last time that you and I thought about the state of our heart, that our greatest need has already been met in Jesus, not been met because of our great works, all the things that we do for church, all the different ways we try to serve the Lord in our families and to our friends, but our greatest need has been met through the gospel of Christ. And if our greatest need has already been met, we should be able to rejoice and be amazed and glorify God just in the same manner and way that the people left when they saw what Jesus did in verse 12. I'll close with this illustration. It comes from another pair of, it comes from a, a disabled woman by the name of Joni Erickson Tada. Um, and she was paralyzed from the shoulder down after going through a diving accident when she was 17. And at first, the first two years of her life, she was discouraged, she was depressed, she was suicidal. And then the gospel became clear to her later on in her life. And after that, even though she was never healed from her disability, she was paralyzed from the shoulder down, that she was an advocate who stood in the place and pushed disability laws in government, as well as to speak on behalf of the Lord and saying and declaring, God is still good, even when I am disabled like this. She, again, a very famous paralyzed woman goes ahead and she talks about an uncomfortable situation that she was met with at a conference where she was there and she was surrounded by 600, 600 other people and then the, um, the conference speaker goes ahead and tells everyone as he closes to go onto their knees and end in prayer. So as you can imagine this, 600 people push away their chairs and they go on their knees, everyone except Joni Erickson Tata, who's confined to her wheelchair. She's the only one sitting and not kneeling in this great conference. She recounted as she looked around that she couldn't stop crying but notice her words, and these are the words of a paralyzed person who knew that her needs were fully met in Christ. She writes, and I quote, Oh, and I was not crying out of pity. I mean I wasn't crying because I felt strange or different, that I was the only one sitting. No, my eyes were wet because it was so beautiful to see everyone kneeling in prayer. And it made me think of the day when I too will be able to get up out of this wheelchair on new resurrected legs. I can't wait for that day because when I get my glorified body, the first thing I'm going to do with my resurrected legs is to fall down on grateful glorified knees. I will once again have the chance to say with Psalm 95, 6, come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. You know, I realize that in heaven, I'll have the chance then to jump and dance and walk and run. It will be my privilege. A new body that can move will be a blessing for a job well done on earth. But I think that kneeling very still on bended, glorified knees. I think when I get to heaven, that'll be my sacrifice of praise. To not move when I will be able to move will be my one last chance to show the Lord 
how thankful I really am. Friends, have Jesus met your greatest need? Will you give a sacrifice of praise like this? Can we understand and know that Jesus has already met the thing that we needed most, the forgiveness of our sins? And if that being the case, when you and I go to heaven, what will our sacrifice of praise be? How will we glorify God when we're there? Praise God for his forgiveness. Praise God for his grace. And may we rejoice and delight in the news of the gospel that our sins are forgiven in Jesus. Let's pray.